Again, we arrive at the uh, section of our worship service where we look at God's word. And um, the title of today's sermon is The Great Defeat. And the scripture reading is from Matthew 4, 1 to 11. And Robert Collins will do the scripture reading for us today. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. These are the true and inspired words of God. Thank you, Jesus, for defeating the devil's temptation in the wilderness for us. Amen. Amen. You know, I imagine all of us have wondered why the Holy Spirit would lead Jesus into the wilderness to face the devil to be tempted. And of course, we know this event happened shortly after the baptism of Jesus. The heavens were opened and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And as we read these verses, let us not forget who Jesus is. Jesus is God. We read in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So Jesus is God. And Jesus came from heaven to this earth to be incarnated as a man. And this is a, an awesome miracle. God, can, nothing is possible with God and God created us for a marvelous purpose. And we were in a mess. And he knew that the only way for us to get out of the mess was for him to come and intervene in our place as one of us. And Jesus lived as a man with the same fallen human nature we all have. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit as the Son of Man. He was conceived in the womb of a virgin named Mary. And Mary was also a descendant of fallen man <coughs> from the tribe of Judah, a descendant of King David. Because no Jew had ever succeeded in obeying God perfectly, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. So that's important to, to realize that Mary had the same human nature as we have, and being conceived in her, then David, then Jesus also had the same uh, human nature as we have. He never ceased to be God, but he became man. Except for Jesus, everyone fell into the trap of Satan the devil. And it began in the Garden of Eden, when both, where both Adam and Eve listened to the serpent rather than God. And they fell into the trap of desiring to be like God, knowing good and evil. And the devil tricked them and lied to them saying that God was withholding something very important from them. 
And he began by attacking Eve, by putting a doubt in her mind. So let's look first at what God exactly told Adam. And he told Adam this even before Eve was created. He said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then came along the devil later on. And he just distorted what Jesus had said. He said, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree of the, of the garden? And he said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so he just tricked her and she fell for the lie. And so when Jesus came to the earth and when he began his ministry, never stopping to be God, but having set, set aside his his divinity to become one of us and being full of the Holy Spirit, he had to contend, to contend and resist and struggle with sin just like every one of us because sin lived in his body just like sin is each in, in each and every one of us. Sin is not in God. There's no, there's nothing sinfulness in God, but in our human nature, Sin still lives there, even if we have a new life, and we will not be rid of it until the resurrection, of course. And we know that Jesus had the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we read that in Colossians 2.9. We read that, for in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So he had the Holy Spirit. Holy. And of course, it is said of Jesus that during his ministry on earth, he was Emmanuel. He was God with us, as we read in Matthew one twenty three. And we all know from reading God's word that Jesus never sinned once. And yet he became sin for us. And we read about that in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, for us, for you and I, for the whole world, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Isn't that a great promise? From no righteousness to receiving the righteousness of God in Christ. Can you imagine that, that this perfect God who live in perfect love, perfect harmony would become sin for us? Hard to imagine, isn't it? And him who is eternal, when he took our human nature, he not only took upon himself our sin, but he also accepted the consequence of, of sin, which is, which is death. He entered our, gar our darkness completely, completely. And in Galatians 3.13, we read that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Imagine Jesus, the perfect God, who has been, Father has been with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one God for all eternity, completely holy, became a curse for us. Just blows my mind. I, I, I personally have difficulty understanding all of that that means, but I know it's true. Because he took 
all the filthiness of humanity in himself, in his body. And he took it all for us. So during today's sermon, we're going to consider why the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted, to be tested and tempted by the devil. We read in, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, the Holy Spirit did not lead Jesus to the desert to be tempted to sin. He, he, Jesus was going to be tested as a man. The devil's intent is very different than God. God does test us. But the devil wants us to sin. He wants us to be separated from God. He wants us to rebel against God just like he is. And in the original language, the word tempt that we read in our Bible can have two different meanings depending on the context. So it's important that we look at the context. It can mean a test rather than tempted when referring to God because God does not tempt anyone. So the word tempt in the original language has different meanings depending on the context. And the same is happens in the English language. If we think of swing, you know, you can have a children's swing or you can have a golfer swing, which are completely two different things, but yet the same word is used. And these are called homonyms. Uh, you know, we can think of the bark of a dog and the bark of a tree. You know, depending on the context, they have completely different meaning. And so in Genesis 22, 1, we read, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. This is from the King James Version. So that did God, that God did tempt. And when we read it in the ASV, which is the correct translation, when we look at the context, because God never tempts anyone to sin. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. So the, contact, the, the context there is God testing Abraham, not to make him fall, but to see his heart if he was completely devoted to God, completely trusting in God. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, we see, do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer, but come together again so that Satan may not tempt. And again, this is the same word, uh, you because of the lack of self-control. So Satan, when he temp tempts, it's not, it's not to test us. He tempts to make us fall. He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And then we read in Hebrews eleven seventeen, where the same word is used. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered to up Isaac, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. So again, it's the same word for tested in the Strong's is three nine eight five, as you see there on the screen. But depending on it, depending who who it refers to as the as the subject, if you will, either Satan or God, then it takes on two different meanings. So we have to to be aware of that as we read God's word. And so uh, and the devil, so the, the Holy Spirit sent Jesus in the wilderness. But the devil had a very different intent, if you will, when he tempted Jesus. He, it, he wanted Jesus to do evil. The Holy Spirit would never do that. 
So some of the some you'll see some of the Bibles, some of the commentaries. They will see when the 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 headlines for, if you will, or the title for this section of scripture is called the testing of Jesus, and that is really more accurate than than the the tempting of Jesus. If we think um, again, if if the word is used for God, it's it's to it's to it's to test if it's used by the devil is to make us fall james 1 13 tells us very clearly that no one let no one say when he is tempted i'm being tempted by god for god cannot tempt with evil and he himself tempts no one because there's no evil in god God is the perfect God. He'll never, he, he, he doesn't tempt us to sin, never. He might test us and he, he does test us, but he will never test us to fall. He tells, he, he, it's, he, his testing is to strengthen his people. So basically the Holy Spirit sent Jesus into the wilderness to undo and nullif nullify the sin of the first Adam. You know, Jesus is the last Adam. He's not the second Adam. There's not no, there's no other Adam to come apart from Jesus. He's the last Adam. And we read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. We read, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, referring to Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. So, Jesus went into the wilderness to do what the first Adam could not do. Resist the devil. Stay faithful to God. And defeat the devil. That's why he went. To undo what the first Adam had done. So let's, let's now consider the temptation thrown at Jesus by the devil. He, because he intended to derail Jesus. He, he intended to derail his mission on earth. And he is very devious. You know, he's described as a liar and a murderer by Jesus. And before we go there, I'd just like to quickly, uh, a very common scripture that sometimes we can misinterpret. misinterpret. Um, and it's found in um, 1 Corinthians uh, 10 to 13. 11 to 13 it says now these things happened to them as an example but they were written down for our instruction on whom the ends of the age has come therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall no temptation has overcome you that is not common to man god is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but, when the but with the temptation, he will also provide the way to escape, that you may be able to endure it. So the context of this passage is idolatry. So in whatever situation we are, the point that Paul is making is that God will strengthen us so that we do not turn to anyone other than Jesus Christ, other than God. We are told to flee idolatry. And idolatry is basically anything that we put our trust in apart from God. So sometimes it, these temptations have been equated with suffering. You know, God told us that we would suffer. And, and we do as human beings. Temptations are a different things. Temptations have the, have their origin and are rooted in the devil and they want to make us fall and god says that he will strengthen us so that in our minds as we stay faithful to him that he will help us stay faithful to him that's the promise that he makes in whatever situation we are it may be the death of a close one of a close one it may be health problems it may be family problems it may be work problems it may be anything and, you know, in those situations, we are tempted. And God is telling us, look to me, 
and I will help you not to look to any other than me. That's basically what God is telling us. So I just wanted to say that because in the past, I know that we often uh, refer to these temptations as suffering and they're not, they're not the same at all. Um, because there's a lot of people who suffer, many of you suffer, and yet you stay faithful to God. Why? Because God helps you as you trust in him to stay faithful to him, not to turn to idols. So Jesus knows what we need. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. It didn't say, it doesn't say anything about thirst here, just about hunger. And the tem temper came to him and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So it's an understatement. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. It's a true statement that after 40 days, he was hungry. And the devil tempted him with a way to satisfy a legitimate human need. Food. And physical food is necessary to satisfy our needs momentarily. And when temptations come from the devil, they always demand a choice. So it's an internal battle that happens very quickly. He's the outside source. He uses it. And on the inside, we have to decide very quickly that we are going to stay faithful to Jesus. And Jesus knew very well that man needs something much more than the momentary satisfaction of physical needs. Physical food satisfies, but it does not satisfy forever. And now Jesus did not deny that we need physical substance. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. So we need bread. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And this is a powerful statement, isn't it? As human beings, we too often pick and choose what we want to follow in God's word. And Jesus made an astounding statement that we need to take the word, every word of God, seriously. It's only then that we can find real satisfaction in God. That it's, and it's, a, it's, it's a satisfaction that we receive from God. We do not manufacture it. God gives, us, gives it to us. So again, temptation always has two triggers. There's a trigger from the outside, which is rooted in the devil. And secondly, there's in, there is our inward reaction to the temptation. And they take, temptation takes many forms depending on what situation we are. And so he was, the devil was rebuked by God, but he did not give up. He continued with another temptation, with two other temptations actually at that particular time. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your, your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So the, the devil knows the scriptures and he knows how to twist them. Because this is what we read in Psalm 91. For he will command his angel concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So he took out the word will guide you in all your ways. And so he does that. He just twists the scripture so that 
it's a testing of God. He, 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 and so we have to be aware of the word of God to be able to counter these attacks because there are many and they may come from different sources. Because he will try to do the same thing to us. He may do it by thinking that we cannot be forgiven. He will try to make us think that we are not valuable in God's eyes. He will try to make us think that we are not his beloved children. He will attempt to turn our regrets into guilt. All of us have regrets. When we look at our past lives, there are, there are things that we, we regret, sins that we've committed, that we, that we regret that we've committed. There are things that bad decisions that we took. And, and the devil will accuse us of those regrets and he will turn those regrets into guilt. Now, we are not to deny that we have regrets. But we are to acknowledge that we have been forgiven by God and we are not to always linger in the past. You know, fomenting that guilt and that that self put down and everything else because that's we we are forgiven we are forgiven by god in christ we have a clean slate if you will and that's what paul tells us in romans 8 1 to 3 he says there is therefore no con condemnation for those who are in christ jesus so why should we condemn ourselves when Jesus tells us there's no condemnation, united to Jesus Christ. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So the sin that we have in our flesh has been condemned in Jesus Christ for us. And in him we have a new life. So we have to watch out the self-talk that we have. And it's all, we all have to do that. There's not one of us who doesn't have to do it, to do that. You know, again, we are not to deny regrets of, of past mistakes, but they are not to take center stage. Because otherwise, we stay locked in the past. And this is not God's will. And with God's help, we nullify these lies by reminding ourselves that God has taken our death, our death of sin in himself. And there are so many lies that the devil throws at, at us. And we hear it all around. For example, there is the idea that because we are children of God, that God has to answer our prayers. And it comes out in such ideas as name it and claim it, as suggested by the health and wealth religious movements. So if you claim it, God has to, to, to make it realized, it has to make it happen. And God... You know, it's the idea that if we pray to God, that God has to respond to give us what we pray for. In other words, we control God. We don't control God. We are to submit to God and submit to his will. Another false idea that is that if we have enough faith, God will always heal us. This is magical thinking. God has never promised that we would not suffer various kinds of trials. Again, suffering and temptations are not the same. The temptations of the devil, he will use circumstances to stop trusting in God, to, to get us to stop trusting in God and to take things into our hands. That's where the temptations are. But we know there are very faithful Christians 
and some are you some of you are going through that you are suffering some illnesses for some years many years some of you and you are faithful to god you look to him in your circumstances or another or again that we are somehow saved magically by the water of baptism it does not matter what we believe if we have been baptized this is our ticket to heaven well you know baptism is ordained by god but baptism doesn't save us baptism is an outward, an outward sign that we admit that we are sinners that we die to sin in jesus christ and coming out of the water that we are given a new life in jesus christ so baptism is symbolic of our death and new life in christ and god wants us to be baptized to acknowledge that publicly what we have gone through it's a public affirmation of repentance another lie that is so prevalent and so mixed up is that the old covenant is not obsolete the epistle in the of the hebrews tells us that it's obsolete that's not where we look for direction we look to jesus christ for direction so imposing our will upon god is testing god god is very clear that we are not to do that we are not to put god to the test you know jesus mission was not to show his love through acrobatics by throwing himself off the temple and things like that he came to die on the cross to do away with sin acrobatics never show god's love but dying on the cross does you know acrobatics they last for a little while i i remember the first time that uh, man flew to the moon on july 21st 1969 um neil armstrong the first american astronaut walked on the moon uh, he walked on the sea of tranquility and the whole world was amazed by that but what what oh, are we still as amazed when people fly to the moon now no we just take it for granted that human beings have the ability to do that so yesterday's tricks and acrobatics are quickly forgotten they are here today gone tomorrow but jesus dying on the cross continues to be remembered and celebrated to this day and jesus knows the father's heart he knew where his trust was he did not entertain a conversation with the devil for very long he quoted scripture and he says you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And he resisted Satan for all of us, but he did not resist God the Father. And Jesus never compromised. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kings of the world and their glory. And he said, all these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. So Satan offered Jesus the easy way out to be the ruler of the world. Again, this was not how Jesus was going to do it. That was not his mission. He knew very well that this world's glory was just very temporary in fact he came to replace the king to replace the kingdom of this world with the kingdom of god so he was not going to he, he did not want to identify with the system of that is filled with violence and lies and distortions of the truth and the rejection of god the father he came to replace that fallen kingdom with god's kingdom god's perfect kingdom where no evil will exist and he just put an end to the conversation be gone satan for it is written you shall worship the lord your god and him only 
And again, the devil is relentless. He did not stop uh, after tempting Jesus after he met him in the wilderness. We read in, in Luke 14, in 4, 4, 13, we read, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. The devil, you know, cannot go after Jesus now. But in his relentlessness, he wants, he goes after God's beloved children. Who are called now to, and he, he, he tries to get them to forsake their relationship with God. In 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9, we read, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He wants to derail us from our relationship with God. And we are to be aware of the devil's schemes. We are to recognize them and we are to ward them off, not fall into those traps with the help of God. And it's only with the help of the indwelling Holy Spirit that we rec recognize Satan's strategies of deception. And we are to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the scheme of the devil. And sometimes we fall. We are fallen human beings. We fall into the trap. But God has won the victory for us. And once we realize that we fall into a trap, then we have to repent, admit it, say, I've sinned against you. I was wrong. I want to follow you. I want to worship you. I want to walk with you, Jesus, and simply admit it. So what are some of the devil's schemes? Well, he lies he lies in, in that he is the, he's the father of lies, as we read in John 8.44. He blinds the minds of the, unbelie of the unbelievers. He disguises himself as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians 11.4. He works through people to do false signs and wonders, wicked deception as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 10. He tempts people to sin. I misspelled that. So He says in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, he says, Paul said, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So we have to be careful. We are warned. And he makes sure that people who hear God's word and who do not understand it will not persevere in the word. And we read that in Matthew 13, 19. He's completely opposed to us. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in, the, in his heart. That it was that that is what's sown. That is, that is what was sown along the path in the parable. So he's there. He, he's against conversion. He's against turning to God. And he'll do anything for the, the seed of the truth of God not to take root. And he causes diseases. We read that in several places in Luke 13 and Acts 10. So we are not to underestimate him. He, he's very, he's very deceitful. And there are many, many examples that I could use, but you know, some that are going around in our in social media and everywhere else, instead of calling out a lie, 
uh, people will say, well, he or she is economical with the truth. Or some, they will say, well, he has a poor relationship with the truth. Instead of saying, well, it's a lie. And this is the world system. People are blind. We are, you know, God, they're in God's hands still. But we have to be aware as God's people that a lie is a lie. It's a lie by however we call it. And he'll do anything to distort the truth of God. And I could use many other examples. And, you know, our lives are sanctified. They belong to God. And yet, the world is trying to make us think that our life belongs to us. When it doesn't, it's been redeemed. And we know that as God's people. And he accuses us before God. And I heard a voice, a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of God, of our God and the authority of the Christ has, have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. So he accuses us, he accuses us in our thoughts. It's powerful, very deceitful, but he's on a leash. He will not do anything more than what God allows. And he deceives people by making people believe that he does not exist. He operates by stealth. You know, like there are weapons now that are made that, you know, are so fast that they cannot be detected. Well, he makes us believe that he doesn't exist. What a lie that is. So how are we to combat all of this? Well, I'll just go, go through this very quickly. Uh, we are to be, we are to, we are to fasten the belt of truth as we read in Ephesians 6. Because G, um, having put on the breast, the breastplate of righteousness. So who is the breastplate of righteousness? Well, Jesus is. He is the one making us righteous. And we are not, we are not to doubt it. Uh, and then he tells us, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. You know, in this, in this troubled world, we receive peace in Jesus Christ. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the, the, the evil one. So how do we do that? By drawing close to God, by knowing scripture, by knowing the character of God, by recognizing that there are certain things that are do not reflect God's and we can uh, we are to bring our thoughts in captivity to obedience of, to Jesus Christ we are to take on the helmet of salvation because we have a new life in Jesus we are forever secure in him and we are to take the word of the spirit which is the word of God again anything that is that goes against the word of God is not, is not the truth. We are to recognize it. And we are to pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. We are to pray for all the saints. And we realize that the, the spirit prays for us all the time. And we are to ask that the church will be able to proclaim this good news of the message you know, that Jesus preached, that the apostle wrote about, that we have, that we will stay faithful to us. You know, we need to remember that Jesus has won the victory for us. So let us walk confidently united to Jesus, because in him we are victorious, and no one can snatch us away from him. Jesus has defeated our mortal enemy in his territory in the wilderness. So let's praise God and thank God as we take communion and realize that our, so we have such a tremendous need for Jesus. He's the one who satisfies all our hunger. Amen.